Praise the Lord, everyone. We welcome you to our live stream tonight for our Wednesday evening worship and the word. And uh, we are glad that you have tuned in with us here tonight. Uh, things are a little different tonight. My wife was unable to be here uh, due to some circumstances. She's fine, but she was unable to be here tonight. So uh, I'm just going to open with prayer tonight and we're going to go to the Lord and ask Him to touch us in our time together in Bible study tonight, but also uh, ask Him to touch some special needs that have been uh, brought to us. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and open that right now. Uh, so if you want to uh, go ahead and, and type in a request, if you have a request, we'll try our best to uh, make mention of that while we're all on here together. Uh, Sister Bobby Murphy uh, sent in a request, a request for actually two unspoken requests uh, for her, um, for the church to remember tonight. So please uh, make mention of that when you pray. Also, Sister uh, Tammy McCamus has uh, requested prayer for her uh, brother-in-law with some health problems that he's having. She asked that we would take that before the Lord uh, tonight as we pray. Uh, also, uh, Sister Tammy Norman uh, still uh, going through what she's going through. We want to be in prayer for her. God will continue to touch her. Uh, she did receive some good news at the doctor that they uh, had not detected any cancer, uh, any other cancer in her body. So we thank God for that. That's a tremendous testimony. Uh, but she needs, still needs the touch of God as she recovers and the Lord to help her to feel better and, and uh, all of the issues that she has uh, to subside as she can continue her radiation treatments uh, without complication. So pray for her. Uh, also, Sister Wilma and uh, Sister Brenda, uh, they have left me a couple of voicemails this week, and I've not been able to connect with them. I apologize to them for that, but uh, they've both asked for prayer for their uh, for their health, for their home, for different things going on there with Sister uh, Wilma and her health, is, uh, obviously. But also, Sister Brenda uh, had a, a bone break there that's not recovering uh, right, and uh, so she's asking for the church to uh, help her pray uh, about that. Uh, Brother Campbell has sent a request for uh, the Boswell family that God would touch that family. God knows the need. Uh, Sister Becky has uh, asked for continued prayer for Kinsley, uh, their granddaughter, as well as all of their family. She has good news that she uh, will possibly be getting out of the hospital tomorrow. So we thank God for that. Amen. That's a tremendous uh, testimony. We've been praying for that and uh, thankful to hear that news. Uh, Brother Tommy has asked for prayer, uh, for continued prayers, touch of bronchitis that he's trying to uh, get past and the, the, the lingering uh, sickness that he's had that God uh, would touch him as well. And uh, for any of you that, that, that are in our church family and you, you have a need tonight, we, uh, we want to we wanna go to God in prayer tonight and ask the Lord uh, to touch us all and to, and to help us as we, as we pray. Uh, that God would strengthen our church, that God would bless us and continue to place that hedge of protection around us that we know He has done. I, I have no doubt in my mind that, uh, that the Lord has been protecting our church, protecting our church family, and uh, we are so thankful for that, that God has been so very good uh, to us, and we, we, are, we are grateful for that. So we're going to go to God in prayer, and, and I've made mention of some of these, and if some of them, uh, of some more come through as we're praying, if you're looking at your screen, uh, let's just uh, do what we can to make mention of these needs in prayer, uh, that God would, uh, would touch them uh, as only He can. Let's pray together, church. God, we love you tonight. Lord, we thank you for this privilege to come together. Lord, even in this means, we thank you, Lord, that, that several of us are gathered together, Lord, calling upon your name, Lord, for you are great and mighty and you are holy. Lord Jesus, we know, oh God, that our help comes only from you. I ask you, Lord, uh, to touch each and every one of these needs, Lord, that I have read off here, that we have spoken out loud. We pray, God, for healing for bodies, Lord, that you would touch and strengthen and heal. God, I pray, Lord, for those that are in any other type of need tonight, Lord Jesus, that you would touch them and help them, God. Lord, supply according to your riches and glory. God, we know, Lord Jesus, that you are our help. 
We thank you right now, Lord, for the way you have helped us. We thank you for the way you have helped our church. We thank you for the way you've been helping our families. We thank you, Lord, for all of your wonderful ways, God, for the great things that you have done. We give you glory and we give you praise and we give you honor for all that you've done. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for keeping your hand upon your people. We give you praise for it all right now in Jesus' mighty name. And would you say amen at home? God bless you uh, tonight. We want to, uh, we're going to go to the uh, word of the Lord here in just a moment. But before we do, just want to remind you, this is our midweek worship in the word. And as a part of our midweek service, as always, we don't let an opportunity go uh, by without giving you an opportunity uh, to give to the Lord for the Bible uh, tells us that we should do that. So we, we want to give you that opportunity right now at this, uh, at this time. So we remind you that right now in this situation we have four ways for you uh, to give to the sanctuary. You can uh, give in person. If you want to wait till Sunday, you're welcome to do that. You can drop that off uh, today here at the church. You can mail that in. Our address is the sanctuary, 210 Luther Street, Greenville, Tennessee, 37745. You can also give online at our website, sanctuarytnfortennessee.org. You can go to the website, register there, and give that way. Or you can text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to this number, area code 423 250 Two five seven two. So those ways are available to you to give to the work of the Lord, and we thank you for that. And how many of you know tonight that the Lord loveth a cheerful giver? Would you say amen? Amen. God bless you tonight. We're thankful uh, for the opportunity to come to you and to share the word of the Lord, and uh, we're going to get right into it tonight and uh, just uh, share with you what we believe the Lord has laid on our heart for this service. I want to take you to Matthew chapter number 7. So if you have your Bible there with you at home or wherever you are, uh, or if you can pull it up there on your device, Matthew chapter number 7 is where uh, one of the parables of Jesus is taught. And I want to take that tonight, read just a few verses here, and, uh, and perhaps uh, challenge us through the word of the Lord tonight with the help of the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter number 7, beginning in verse number 24, Matthew 7, verse number 24. Here's what the Bible says. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat up on that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Tonight, for just a few minutes, I would like to uh, speak to you on this thought. Two disciples. Two disciples. This is a wonderful story that the Lord uh, teaches here. Uh, to put it in context tonight, this parable, Jesus is teaching His disciples. This is what we uh, refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. That's the part of the scripture that we're in here and and he's teaching his disciples I think that's a very important distinction to make tonight Jesus is not talking to sinners he's not preaching to the lost he's not preaching to uh, people who have no familiarity with the kingdom of God or living for God but he is he's preaching to the choir so to speak he's talking to his disciples in fact the message translation introduces this passage to show us that Jesus always expects more from his disciples than he does from the rest of the crowd. In uh, Matthew 5, verse number 1 of the message, it says, When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. 
Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions, and this is what he said. That's exactly why uh, he says that there are, there are two... Uh, we're seeing a distinction here. Jesus is, 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 is making a distinction, and we see this distinction made in other places of Scripture. He says there are two ways in Matthew chapter number 7. There are two ways, one which is narrow, which we understand. The Greek literally means it is restricted or it is confined. But he says the, that that way leads to life. But he also says there's another way, and that way is, is broad, and it leads to destruction. So Jesus is making a distinction in the two different paths that can be taken. He says there are two ways. He says that, I believe, because there are two kinds of disciples. There are two kinds of disciples. In another place, he draws the distinction that there are two trees found in Matthew chapter number 7. He uh, tells us of the, the one tree which bears good fruit and then one tree which bears evil fruit. There are two trees, I submit to you, because there are two kinds of disciples. He also tells us about two houses in Matthew chapter 7, which is the text that I read for you tonight. Two houses, one which is built on a foundation that stands and one that is built on a, a weak foundation that collapses. We, we call the strong foundation a a sure foundation. It is sure. It is steadfast. It is strong. There are two houses, I say again, because there are two kinds of disciples. I want to remind you tonight, Jesus is not talking to sinners here. He's not talking to the lost. He's talking to His followers. He's talking to disciples. And He is trying to teach them really some pretty profound lessons about life here. And it goes something like this. Number one, every person is building a house. I want you to let that sink in tonight. Every person, every one of us, me, my wife, my children, you, your spouse, those of your household, every person is building a house and alone, this word is symbolic. You see, in Scripture, the word house can be used to describe uh, a few things. It can be used to describe someone's own life, like it is in Matthew chapter number 12. It can also be used to speak of your family, such as your household, like it is in 1 Timothy chapter 3. But it, it, it could also be speaking of the church itself, obviously, when it refers to the Lord's house, like over in the book of 1 Peter. There's a host of other things that can be symbolized by the building of a house. But the point is, whether you are building a life, whether you are building a reputation, whether you're building a family, whether you're building a society, or whether you're building a church, the biblical principle is if you're going to build, you need to build carefully. If you're going to build, you need to make sure that you build carefully. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, I want you to hear this tonight because it goes beautifully with what we're talking about. In verse 10 it says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now for most of you that are listening to this right now, for most of you that just listened to that passage of Scripture, 
you might have understood 25% of what he was saying there because sometimes the King James translation just doesn't make it very simple to comprehend. But another translation puts it this way. Using the gift God gave me as a good architect. This is Paul talking. So when Paul calls himself a wise master builder, it is through the wisdom that God gave him to build. He says, using the gifts God gave me, I designed blueprints. Apollos is putting up the walls. Let each carpenter who comes on the job take care to build on the foundation. Remember, there is only one foundation, the one that's already laid. Jesus Christ. Take particular care in picking out your building materials. Eventually, there's going to be an inspection. And if you use cheap or inferior materials, listen to this, if you use cheap or inferior materials, you will be found out. The inspection will be thorough and rigorous and you won't get by with a thing. That's a little easier to understand. The Lord is teaching us that we are all building a house. And if we are all building a house, then we should all build very carefully. The second thing I want you to notice tonight is that not only are we all building a house, but obviously from the word of the Lord, basically every person is either a wise builder or a foolish builder. Now I want you to let that sink in because this, if, you'll, if you'll stay with me tonight, I believe the Lord's really going to strengthen you through His Word. Basically, everyone is building a house and everyone is either a wise builder or a foolish builder. The Scripture said in Proverbs chapter 24, "...through wisdom is a house builded." And by understanding it is established. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all pleasant and, I'm sorry, precious and pleasant riches. Through wisdom is a house building. And by understanding it is established. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled. Now that's some heavy information right there. And I'll tell you why. Because there are three key components that are revealed in two short verses of Scripture. In those two verses of Scripture, it talks about what needs to be utilized in the building of your house, and it talks about knowledge, it talks about understanding, and it talks about wisdom. Say it with me. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom need to all be present in the building of anything whether it's a community, whether it's a church, whether it is a physical house, whether it is a marriage, whether it is a family, whether it is your life, whatever you're building, all three of these things need to be there. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Most of you all already understand this, and, and I just want to help you understand it maybe a little bit better tonight. But those are, those are three different things that are closely tied together. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom are not the same thing. But it could be easily described this way. Knowledge is simply the observation of something. Okay? Knowledge is the observation of something. Understanding is the ability to explain it. The ability to explain it. And wisdom is the ability to apply it. So that, that would help us think in terms of what we need in our life when we build a house. We need knowledge. We need understanding. And we need wisdom. The biblical concept, ladies and gentlemen, of hearing is much the same as obedience. In other words, if you don't do what is said, then, then, then the, the scripture indicates that you really didn't hear it. I mean, let's be honest, folks. There are a lot of similarities between the two builders that Jesus taught about in this parable. There's a lot of similarities here. For all we know in this parable, the two houses may have looked exactly the same. 
When you read this story, is that kind of the way you read that or you imagine that? Do you imagine both houses looking basically the same as though they're twin structures only to find out that the foundation in one is severely lacking and clearly it is not what it appears to be. The only real difference really between the wise man and the foolish man is the presence of a sure foundation and that's what Jesus calls obedience. Luke, ch Luke chapter 6 says, uh, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Jesus is saying, Why would you even refer to me as Lord if you're not going to do the things that I've told you to do? Why would you even start building unless you've laid the foundation first? Why would you put one brick on top of another? Why would you nail anything together unless you're going to build the foundation first? James echoes that thought in James chapter 1 when he says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving only yourself. The foundation of my life is my obedience. The foundation of your life is your obedience. The foundation of a person's life is their obedience to... We're not just talking about obedience to man here, so please don't misunderstand. I'm talking about our obedience to the word of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, the mere presence of disobedience in a person's life indicates the absence of what is absolutely necessary, and that is a foundation. I'm going to tell you I have seen it over and over and over again. If someone lacks that foundation, if there is no obedience to the Word of God, there is no submission in their life to God and His Word, it does not matter what they try to build on top of it. It does not matter what they try to put together. All of it is going to come crumbling down one day because it's not built on something that is sure. Would you say amen? The foundation is necessary. It is absolutely necessary. It's not like it's something that you can just choose to skip. So when we consider a house, there are only really three major parts of a house. And this is where I want to really bring this in its simplest form so that we can make the connection here. There are really only three major parts of a house. Number one, you've got the proper foundation. Psalm chapter 11 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 that we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Hebrews chapter 6, the writer here says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation. We, we've, the foundation is laid. We're going to build on the foundation now. The foundation, we understand, in, in, in our life and our walk with God is our obedience to the Word of God. It is our obedience to the Word of God in salvation. The foundation is our salvation, but ladies and gentlemen, a foundation is of no use whatsoever if you do not build on the foundation. I wish I had some folks that believed what I'm talking about that would say amen tonight. The foundation is of no use if you don't build on the foundation. A set of footers is useless if you don't build on a foundation, if you don't build on those footers. If you look out into the field and you see a concrete slab, it is useless if nobody takes the next step and builds on top of it. I'm going to tell you in much the same way, your salvation experience is not going to do you a lot of good unless you build on that foundation. It's not enough for you just to say, well, I, you know, I've been baptized in His name and gotten the Holy Ghost. I think I'm good until the rapture happens. No, you need, to, you need to get that worked out in your mind because it is important for you to go on into perfection. We don't lay aside. I mean, we don't, we don't pour again the foundation, but we set it to the side to build on that. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Foundation is necessary. But if you never build on the foundation, what good is 
the foundation. So that's the first component of the house that's necessary. That's a strong foundation. How many of you are thankful tonight that we have a strong foundation? Aren't you thankful tonight that we've got a strong foundation in our church? That we, you've got a strong foundation in your family. You've got something sure and steadfast that can be built upon. And you know it's never going to fail you. You know why? Because there's no cracks in the foundation. There's no cracks in the foundation. This message that this life is built upon, that our life in God is built upon, there's no weakness in it. There's no crack in it. There's no room for anything to, to unravel it and try to tear it down or destroy it. It is perfect. It is strong. It is sure. And it is steadfast. You can build your life upon this salvation. So that foundation is absolutely necessary. The second thing you got to have is the structure, which is what I've been leading toward. You got to have the structure. God gave Noah the instructions on how to build the ark of safety. And it had to be built the way God said to build it. Amen? It had to be built the way God said to build it. It had to be built according to the divine pattern. If he wanted to... Now, he could have built anything he wanted to build just for the sake of everybody seeing it. But his goal was not to impress people. His goal was not for somebody to, to just sit back and say, wow, he's, he's listening to God and oh, what an incredible task he's accomplishing. No, the, the, the overall goal here is for, is for this thing to be able to withstand the flood. And if this, if this art can't withstand the flood, it doesn't matter anything else I've done. So it's got to be built according to the pattern. Would you say Amen. Genesis chapter 6, he told, the Lord told him, he said, this is the fashion that you will make it of. He said the length of the ark, 300 cubits, the breadth of it, 50 cubits, the height of it, 30 cubits, a window shalt thou make in the ark, and in a cubit thou shalt finish it above, and the door of the ark, you shall set it in the side thereof, for lo with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. Only those within the framework of that ark we're going to survive that 40-day period. So this was important, right? This was so very important. Noah couldn't just look at this and say, well, I think I'm going to fudge a little bit over here. He couldn't look at this, maybe this area over here of the ark in the middle of the building and say, you know what, nobody will ever know. If this is just if, if this is a little bit shorter than it's supposed to be, nobody will ever know if the material quality is not exactly what it should be. Nobody will ever know if, if this area is, mi is missing some pitch on the wall. Nobody will ever know any of that. No, he understood. God has given specific instructions, and if we are going to withstand the 40 days that God's bringing upon this earth, then I better build it the way God said to build it. It's not the, it, it, that's not the only time God ever did that, though, is it? It's just simply the first time in Scripture. There's been so many times God has instructed people to build things. And when God says to build, He doesn't just invite you to build haphazardly. It's so incredible that people would live their life and try to live the life of a Christian and think that God does not care how we build the house. Are you all hearing me tonight? To think that God does not care. Well, God doesn't care what you do. Or God doesn't care how you live. Or God doesn't care where you go. God doesn't care about this. God doesn't care about that. For, for, for anybody to think that God somehow does not care about any of the things that pertain to your life and how you're going to build this house, you've clearly not read your Bible it happened in the book of Genesis with the ark. It happened in the book of Exodus with the tabernacle. God gives Moses the command to build the house. He said, I, I, I want them to build a sanctuary that I can dwell among them. But he didn't say, Moses, you know, I, I'm just going to give you an A for effort. Just go build whatever you think needs to be built and, and I'll meet you there and honor your desire to meet with me. That's not how God works. 
No, God gave a very specific plan. As a matter of fact, the very next verse, verse 9 of Exodus 25, he said, according to all I show you, after the pattern of the tabernacle and after the pattern of the instruments, even so shall you make it. Whatever, Whatever I say needs to go here is what you need to do. However I say the instruments need to be constructed, however I say the, the tabernacle needs to be built, that is how you're to build it. Why? Because this wasn't just any structure, ladies and gentlemen. This wasn't, it wasn't just any structure. There was a pattern, folks. There was a pattern. It was God's design. If you're going to build God's house, why would you not use God's design? This is a design that held together through the desert. This is a a design that held up in the wilderness for 40 years of wandering. You see, 40 is the number of testing in Scripture. And this tabernacle held up for the entirety of that wilderness experience. God is always going to test your obedience to Him. God is always going to put you through a place of testing by seeing if you will live within the framework of His commandments. Oh, we're going to do it, ladies and gentlemen. But if we're going to do it, let's do it right. We're going to build it, but if we're going to build it, let's build it right. If we're going to build it, let's build it according to His pattern. Would you say amen tonight? Let's build it according to His pattern. If the house is God's, then the design is God's. God is not going to leave the design to you. You're not the great designer, remember? You weren't there in the beginning whenever he created life and everything of the entire universe. He didn't consult you. He consulted with himself. He is the intelligent master designer. So when he wants something built, he's not going to ask your thoughts on how it should be built. Why? Because I promise you, you're going to look for a shortcut somewhere. I know I would. I know there's a lot of things that if God asked, were to ask my opinion, I'd say, you know what, I think maybe, maybe we could skip. How many of you, if God asked your opinion on building your life, you'd go ahead and skip 2020? Am I right? How many of you say, God, can, can we just go ahead and skip over this year? There doesn't seem to be a whole lot profitable. It's gonna, I'd just rather not even have to do that. Let's just skip on ahead to what's coming next. But... But is it possible that everything that's going on right now, everything that's happened even in 2020 over the last few months, is it possible that God is still working through all of this to help us build the house His way? This is God's house. This is God's house. The structure was His command to be built. So the design is built His way. So I told you, remember, there's three components. You've got to have the foundation. You've got to have the structure. And the third component that has to be there is the covering. There must be a foundation. We've established that. My foundation of obedience to salvation and my my birth of my relationship with God. Then there must be a foundation. There must be a structure built on the foundation, but on top of the structure, there has to be a covering. Once again, look at the ark. There had to be a roof. There had to be a covering. Look at the tabernacle. There had to be a covering. Both of them needed a covering. Sure, now you could argue if you wanted to that each of them would be operational without a covering. You know, could they have floated the ark you know, across the earth without a cup? Well, sure, it probably would have still floated. Could they have, could they have utilized the tabernacle and, and, and still done, did what they did? Would it have been functional without a covering across the top? You could argue that all day long. Operational, yes. But what do you lose by not having a covering? Oh, that's something to consider, isn't it? What do you lose when you don't have a covering? The lack of a covering shows one thing. It exposes your vulnerability. When there is no covering, it causes you to be vulnerable. There is severe vulnerability there. When there's no covering, 
there's no security. There would have been nothing to protect the occupants of the ark from the elements. There would be nothing to protect those who go to worship in the tabernacle from what may be happening on the outside. But again... It wasn't just any covering, what? Jesus, God didn't just say, I, I want you to do all this according to the pattern, but when you go to do that covering, just grab a, a piece of plywood somewhere, you know, as if that was around, and, and just throw that on top of it. You know, as long as it's covered, as long as it's covered. You know, there's a lot of folks living that way today. As long as it's covered, that's all that matters to them. Boy, I could teach on that for a while, couldn't I? Long as it, some folks don't even think it needs to be covered, but they say, well, as long as it's covered, it doesn't matter what it's covered with as long as I've got a covering over my life it doesn't matter what the covering is I know people that are that, that way about their spiritual covering and who they choose to listen to and allow to speak into their heart and into their life so well as long as I got a covering as long as I got somebody no 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 it's not a matter of, of just having something it's not just any covering not even with the tabernacle in the book of Exodus he said make a covering for the tent and use some specific things. He said, make it of ram skins dyed red and a covering above of badger skins. Ram skins dyed red and then cover that with badger skins. The covering of the tabernacle. Now understand this. The coverings of the tabernacle were beautiful on the inside. You got fine linen. You have all of that. But they weren't so beautiful on the outside. Badger skin, that's not very attractive. To the casual observer, to one who would just walk by the outer court and look in, you know, uh, the, the outsider looking in could never appreciate the divine blessings of Jehovah God just by looking at the covering. But how many of you know that covering was necessary? That covering was vital. That covering was so important. Just by looking at the covering, you could never know just how precious that the components on the inside were. But understand, the covering is there for a reason. You didn't really understand God's blessing on Israel until you got under the covering. Did you hear me tonight? You can't understand God's blessing on his people until you get under the covering. It was there. You couldn't see it, but it was there. If you could just if you could just push through everything else, if you would not worry about the badger skin, not worry about the rams uh, dyed, dyed red, not, not worry about any of that, but, but if you could just respect the covering, understand the covering, once you get under the covering, can I just tell you, there's all kinds of beauty under the covering. There's gold under the covering. You see, that covering is God's favor. That covering is God's protection. Once again, and the house is functional without it, but it is so much more valuable with it. It is so much more valuable with the covering. The house has got to be built the way God wants the house to be built. The house needs to be built according to the pattern because make no mistake, the house is going to be tested and I'm going to close with this last part of this lesson tonight and I want every one of you to grab hold of this with me if you can because I do believe the Lord has, has, has given me a word for this night even if it's just, just a few of us that are watching together right now there are those that will watch later and God will speak to them through this I believe that but I told you there are three main parts of a house you've got the foundation You've got the structure and you've got the covering. And just as sure as there are three main parts of a house, there are three main tests that the house will have to go through. There, are, there is a test for every component of the house. A test for every component of a house. There is something that will test all three parts of that house. I gave you the three components of the house. Now I want to give you the three tests of the house. The first test are the floods. Anybody that's ever had their home flood know that's not a fun thing. Anybody that has a basement, 
you, you know that given certain circumstances of the environment around your home, maybe it is more prone to flooding. Maybe you have dampness. Maybe there's a, you have to run a dehumidifier because if you don't, then, then all kinds of crazy things will happen. But, but if, if, you, if you live down in a valley, you know how dangerous it can be. If you live down below a water line, you know how dangerous it can be. There's something uh, pretty neat about living on a hill where you don't have to worry about that because a flood can be a devastating thing. A flood can be, even if it's not from rainfall, even if, it, if, if pipes were to bust in your home and you come home after being gone for a couple of days to a, a flooded floor, that can be a devastating thing. We have some pastor friends a few years ago that, that got a call while, we, while they were at a, a district function that their home had flooded. They had to leave the function early and go home just to discover just incredible devastation. Floods will test us. Scripture says in Isaiah 59 that it talks about fear in the name of the Lord and it talks about that the enemy would come in like a flood. The enemy sometimes will come in like a flood. In today's society, the enemy sends floods of all kinds against the foundation. And that's the most vulnerable part to flooding. It's not the covering that's vulnerable to the flooding. It's not even most of the structure that is in danger when the floods come. But the foundation, the, the foundation is tested by the floodwaters. Today the enemy is sending all kinds of floods out trying to test your foundation. He knows if he can get people to embrace anything and everything... If he can get you to just be, just listen to, to, to some other voice over here, something other than biblical salvation, it doesn't matter what else you build because sooner or later it'll eventually fall. So he'll send a flood over here to test that foundation. He'll send floodwaters in to test what your house is going to be built on. And it, it, you don't even wait sometimes until the house is finished. He'll start testing the foundation just as quickly as you get it poured. Ladies and gentlemen, he didn't say if. He said, when the enemy comes in like a flood. Floods can sometimes represent the attack of the enemy. But make no mistake, floods are the, are the attack against the foundation. But there's something else that tests the structure. It's not the flood. The most the structure is going to be impacted by flood water is oftentimes just maybe just a couple of feet. How many times have you maybe known people, if you've not experienced this yourself, but uh, there was a church in our section that flooded several years ago, and when they went in to do the remediation of that building, they had to cut out the sheetrock so many feet high because it wasn't the entire structure that was, that was hurt, but it was, it was all beyond a, below a certain level that was impacted by the floodwaters. But there is something else that will impact the entire structure, the walls. The second test is the wind. The wind will always test the structure. If you build the structure with inferior materials, strong winds are going to expose it. If you build your structure out of materials that has, should never have been used, the, 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 the first storm with tornado winds is going to challenge your structure. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul said this. He said that, that, that we should get to the place where we are no more like children. And what does he mean by that? Because Jesus said to be humble like children. So Paul's obviously talking about some other quality here. He said, yeah. He said, don't be any more like children tossed to and fro. And carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Can I just tell you folks, there is no shortage of voices in the world to listen to today. There is no shortage of voices if you want to just listen to today. No shortage at all. There are, there, there are people everywhere who are just waiting for the opportunity to speak into your life if you'll give them, that, give them that privilege. Can I just tell you tonight, not everybody deserves the right to speak into your life. 
Not if you should not grant the privilege to just anybody to speak a word into your spirit or into your heart. That not everybody deserves it. Not everybody, not everybody is is uh, not everybody should even be granted that privilege because not everybody is able to speak into your world. So understand that the winds can come based on voices. The winds can be voices. It can be many voices that say God's commandments over here are not necessary or this part of what your church is teaching is not necessary or this part of what you've been living or how you've been living is not necessary. Some people even say, well, this, 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 some of the winds that will come against your structure will be saying things like, well, it's not a salvation issue. Well, it's not an issue at all or this favorite one of mine, is it a heaven or hell thing? You better be careful with those questions of what is or is not heaven or hell. Be careful those voices that are trying to whisper things or say things because what they're trying to do is they're testing the walls. They're testing the structure of the house. Ladies and gentlemen, there are maturity issues for disciples. And we're not talking about the foundation here. We're talking about what we're building. We have we have laid laid to the side the foundation. And now we are striving toward perfected saints of God. We are building a building. And whether we're doing it according to his pattern and doing it his way is the question. Folks, winds represent false doctrine. And you need to be careful with false doctrine and seducing spirits and what you allow to speak into you. I don't care if it's spoken into you by, by a preacher sitting in a congregation. I don't care if it's spoken into you by a podcast. I don't care if it's spoken into you on a news program on television. I don't care. You just need to be very cautious about what you allow to speak in and help build. Because I'm telling you, every word that comes in, Every sentence that's spoken over you, every claim that's made is seeking and looking to add to your structure somehow. It's the wind that's blowing against it. And if it does not mesh up with what God has been allowing you to build, make no mistake, the wind will knock the walls down. Somebody say amen. There's one more test. And if the floodwaters test the foundation... And the winds test the structure. Then rain is the test of the covering. The rain tests the covering. Isaiah chapter 4 verse 6 said, There shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from storm and from rain. In this life, there are so many situations that seem to temporarily block God's favor in my life. I know you've experienced that. I know you felt that, or at least you think that's, why, that's what's happening. There are situations, there are circumstances that it, it seems like they, they, they just block God's favor for a season. But can I just tell you that something you already know? Trials are a test. Trials are a test. Maybe the reason trials continue on is because you still haven't passed the test. They say, well, I've been in this trial for four years. That's a mighty long test. Would you say amen? That's a long test. Now, it is possible that the test is going to take longer than what you want it to take, but it is also possible that I'm still in the trial because I have not passed the test. The adversary attacks our salvation and, and false doctrine attacks God's commandments. And in the same way that that happens to those elements of our life, the trials of life, Attack my sense of God's favor. Family problems, financial problems, sickness, all of these things tend to attack 
me in a way that causes me to question whether or not God is still in charge in my life. And a lot of times we say statements. We don't realize how biblical it is, but we say things like, Wow, when it rains, it pours. Because that's what's happening. The rain is testing your covering. And if your covering is the wrong covering, the rain is going to penetrate the covering. It tries to attack whatever is there. The trials of life will attack the covering. So whatever you've made your covering, if it's not strong enough to withstand the rain, then it is the wrong covering. I'll promise you one thing tonight. The covering of Christ, the covering of Christ Himself is the covering that can withstand any rain. It can withstand any trial. It can withstand any sickness, any financial dilemma, any family chaos. Oh, somebody needs to hear me tonight because we all are going through things, at least right now, or if you're not, you, you might be soon. I'm going to tell you right now, the rain is going to test your covering. So what's the difference, ladies and gentlemen? What, what, if, if we're talking about uh, the, the, the tests of the, of, the, of the house and the components of the house, you know, whether, whether it's, it's building a life, whether it's building a character, whether it's building a family or a, or, or a church, this test is going to come to my house. It's just a matter of time. So what's the difference then? So, Pastor, you're talking about two disciples tonight. What's the difference between the two? It's the difference between a wise disciple and a foolish disciple. And it can be easily summed up this way. The wise disciple is obedient to his God no matter what attacks, false doctrines, or trials come against him. The foolish man's house went up a lot quicker though, but it didn't last as long. So I hope we're building for the long term. Obedience is that foundation, ladies and gentlemen. 1 Samuel chapter 15, the Bible said, Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. I'm just going to tell you folks. It doesn't matter how nice the house looks. If it doesn't have the right foundation. Would you say amen? Let's pray together tonight. That God would help us and allow this word to take root in our heart. God, we love you Lord and we praise you. We thank you Lord for your goodness. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to come together to study your word together. And Lord, I pray that some word that I have spoken tonight, Lord Jesus, as I have felt this in prayer, that some word that is spoken will somehow strengthen somebody listening tonight, their relationship with you, their walk with you. Let it, let it be a strength to the house that they are building. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we will work diligently every day, making sure, oh God, if the foundation's not right, let us get, help us to get the foundation right. For those that are listening that perhaps have not secured that, let that be secured. But God, beyond that, help us to get the structure right, the walls right. We want them to be strong enough to withstand the wind. We want, Lord God, when that wind begins to blow and the windows begin to whistle, God, we want the house to be able to stand. But even in the midst of all of that, Lord, when the rain comes, Lord Jesus, when the trials of life beat down on me and my family, and I say when it rains, it pours, and it seems to be pouring, oh God, I pray that my covering will be the right covering. I pray, Lord Jesus, that my covering will be a righteous covering. I pray that my covering will be the all-powerful, holy, righteous covering that no dart can penetrate, that no rain can deteriorate, and that nothing 
can destroy. I ask it right now, Lord. Cover your people in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And all God's people said together, Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us on our live stream. Don't forget, we uh, will be back in person here Sunday and look forward to a tremendous time in the Lord together, worshiping at 10 o'clock for uh, Sunday school and then 11 o'clock for our main worship service. We look forward to seeing all of you here at the sanctuary Sunday morning. God bless you. Keep praying this week. Amen. Keep seeking the face of God. Pray for the services on Sunday that God will continue to bless in Jesus' name. God bless you tonight.